I was upset by him, an awful thing to say, but I was upset, I think it's awful, but it's normal, by his dying, because I was young, and I wanted him to help me in my career, and he'd smoked himself to death, and there was a, we, we used to row all the time about him smoking, because it completely ruined his, his, uh, his career and his health, obviously, his health and his career, the other way around. He became a leaning actor, when he was in Coronation Street, which is where he died. Um, he did a lot of of leaning on things because he really couldn't breathe properly and lots of and I noticed it it was unbelievably upsetting to see somebody who'd been unbelievably wiry fit man um, because he was terribly emaciated for several years after he came out of prison camp and that and that was a kind of stock thing of him being this wiry wiry looking actor um, uh, to see this 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 caricature and he wasn't breathing properly and he wasn't getting enough oxygen um, so uh, he um, how he managed to act for the last few years of his life I'm 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 amazed. <laughs> there he goes again, Charlie. Not to worry. The whole thing needs to reboot. If you ever happen to see anything from that era, I think the the mirror cracked is a uh, very last film that he made. He's he's the, like a, a caricature of himself, but he he's sort of struggling to do it. But um, he's once again similarly he's playing a very small part again in it. I'm I'm utterly confused about his career that way as to why films were always smallish parts. Yet he's this huge television actor, huge star, and I think if it was now a different era, he would be completely celebrated as being this, this phenomenal actor. And I think it's, it's, it's great, and particularly since I've now rediscovered, um, in a sense, my affection for him, because I found all this information in my mother's loft, because um, my mother died about uh, three years ago, and I've been clearing the place out. And all this, these scripts, I have found so many scripts, um, fantastic scripts, I'm all right, Jack. Um, uh, um, all the Crane series, about f uh, 200 Crane scripts, all in suitcases. I had no idea they were there. Um, uh, and I've now, I've, I've embraced them and I've actually re-evaluated. I found in his bureau the, the whole of uh, his joke book from his Oscar Rabin years. I, mean, I have to say very, not particularly <laughs> great gag, lots of puns. Um, so yes, I, it's, it's actually coincided brilliantly with my kind of re-evaluation. I've now dealt with the fact that I was bitter about him dying because I, I was upset. I wanted him to help my career. I felt that he'd smoked himself to death, which he had. But at the, at the, I'm more sympathetic to it now because I appreciate that he's, uh, it, they, the, everybody did it. Everybody he was in prison camp with all died in their 60s. The stress of being in prison camp was clearly phenomenal, which people didn't, hadn't taken into account. Five years with in utterly deprived environment and the fact they put all these shows on was just absolutely remarkable. My old woman makes the kids pay a penny a week for the Red Cross. I'm writing to her to stop that caper. Red Ruddy Cross. Ruddy sausage we ever get out of it. It's only two months when don't forget there were only a few hundred prisoners here before. Now there are tens of thousands. It's a big job. Yeah don't let's kid ourselves. Nobody worries about us anymore. We've been written off. And then a sense that was his repertory theatre. Uh, so he then had no problem at all leaping into things um, last minute. He, he went into an episode of Shadow Squad, George Moon had been taken ill and he learnt the lines in an evening and went on live, live television, it was fine. So he's constantly establishing a wonderful reputation as being brilliantly, brilliantly, establishing a reputation of being brilliantly professional and, uh, and, and brilliantly uh, competent and, uh, and, and loved by all. Ah, one night and a corner bed, if you'd be so kind. You'll take what you're given. God almighty! Oh, sorry, sir. If it is an old pikey, Parker's clean extraordinaire. Would you look who it is? It's Bernie. As ever was. Well, well. I always did say the army would make a man of you. God's all Monty's makes no odds. Only hope he has the strength. Don't worry. He's got room enough to spare for all of us, including you. Here you are now. Room four. Bed 16. Huh. Mercy bow cups. Well, well, well. Who'd have thought it? The one single memory I would want with my father if I was allowed to relive it would be uh, watching Chelsea with him. Um, which I used to do quite frequently. Well, from a baby, he took me on his lap as a baby. That was in an era where you could, I could be, be taken over the, the turnstile, nobody would bat an eyelid. Nowadays, I think if, I, if I'd taken my daughter to a Chelsea match when she was a baby, they'd have said, oh no, you've got to pay for a ticket for her, even though she'd still be on my lap. But yeah, that was, uh, that was very joyous. And it was um, a period where he sat next to, uh, um, well, quite near him, was Joan Collins' father, who incidentally, he did 
the very first screen test as a stooge, I, the man who read the lines in for Joan Collins when she got picked for her very first film. Um, uh, John Mills was the other side of him. Richard Attenborough was the other side. Vidal Sassoon was down the way. They're all Chelsea fans and all, and all mates, all mates of my dad at that period and all watched Chelsea together. And it was, uh, and of course I was, you know, no conception who I'm sitting with, these luminaries, wonderful luminaries of the business. Um, uh, in fact, Michael Attenborough is, uh, Richard Attenborough's son, um, I'm, I know quite well, is, uh, um, uh, he similarly is wonderfully, um, he's, uh, he's effusive about his father that, uh, in a way that um, I think I share about my father, but uh, um, uh, he appeared from time to time there to, to watch as well. So uh, it, was a, it was a lovely environment. Um, but yeah, that's the, that would be the one, that would be the one thing that I would, uh, I would like to recreate if that was at all possible. But he was so sporty, my dad, and so he'd actually had a trial for Queen's Park Rangers and, um, uh, and, and had been a long distance runner. So he, it was ingrained, this whole thing. He'd constantly go, we lived in Kensington in a, in a flat, rented flat, and uh, we'd go to Holland Park all the time, and he'd play football with me all the time, and he'd play football with, with lots of um, just people come to a pick-up game, and that was his big thing he played. And unfortunately, that was a thing that happened as well. He got very out of breath after a bit because he'd been s smoking so much. Uh, so that was, there was a kind of deterioration for a period that I found quite difficult to deal with as a, as a child because it was pretty obvious what was happening. Which he... he uh, he was being affected by it, but uh, you know, different era. Everybody smoked, you know, non-stop. It was just, I think, the volume of smoking. I think he was on about eighty a day, so, which was just bizarre. But it was, it was a kind of almost a nervous thing. He was quite a, a, a shy man, my father. He, despite his uh, his his a few his outgoing qualities. What's that smell? Disinfecting your sins, Pikey. I'll say this much for you: you haven't changed. Like Mrs. Moppy was. You should have seen his cell after he'd scrubbed up. He could eat off my flour. That's more like a set of yours, anyway. Yeah, you're right there. Well, don't let him get you down, Pikey. No, I won't, Bernard. No. You'll do. I like him. What was he in for? He refused to pay his taxes. Said some authority would use the money to pay for golf clubs. Oh. Would you believe it? You've got to hand it to him. He's a man of principle. I went into my mother's loft and, uh, and discovered in a suitcase, as well as all these hundreds of scripts, uh, in fact, there were several suitcases, um, this autobiography that uh, I remember him writing, but I'd never read at all, and it's it's actually fascinating, and uh, I think would be would uh, would be of, of interest to um, to film buffs. Um, he talks about uh, suddenly that um, uh, he'd done um, 104 films between um, 1945 and 1952, and then suddenly. Uh, Having, after 60 pictures had been made in one year, suddenly, as it seemed, studios began to close. The output dwindled down to a trickle, and 16 productions seemed um, a lot by comparison. Studios closed were Islington, Isleworth, Gaumont British, which was Lime Grove, Riverside, which of course has been, just been demolished and is being, the BBC seemed to buy all these places, and uh, like as with Elstree, um, just been demolished, is being made into block of flats with, uh, with a studio, I think, in it. Um, Walton, um, there was a, a studio at um, St. John's Wood, Culton Hill, I think it was called. I have no idea where that would be. But uh, um, Denham, obviously, Pinewood, uh, MGM, Elstree, all these places were just phenomenal number. When Captive Heart was first shown, I saw it about four times in the cinema and twice on television. I still looked nervous. Uh, I took, he'd been nervous, uh, um, he said, um, when he was doing it, because it was his first film and he was worried about the dialogue. Um, I took my mother to the Odeon Leicester Square to see my worldwide acting debut. When the film was coming round to my bit of dialogue, I nudged her elbow to warn her in advance. Unfortunately, she was adjusting her spectacles at the time and the jolt made her drop them. As I frantically groveled for them under the seat, incurring the wrath of the people behind me and beside me, I heard my voice coming from the screen speaking my immortal line to Jack Warner and Mervyn Johns. Jack had just thumped Jimmy Hanley in the stomach, and as he slumped to the ground, I said, Lummy, they'll have to have you at the peace conference. End of scene, amid general laughter, hopefully. Finding the glasses, I surfaced. My mother sensed that I was fed up. Uh, don't worry, she whispered. Well, it would be like that. Don't worry, she whispered. We'll, we'll sit through it again till you come on. OK, thanks, said I, pleased at her enthusiasm. But when it did come round again, she'd fallen asleep. I hadn't the heart to waken her. 
uh, she pretended she'd seen me, and we, as we edged our way out, she said, you were very good, thin of course, but very good. Later she was to see me in many films and television shows, but the first on the big screen was rather special as far as I was concerned. Oh, sorry, you're a wee bit sticky. Members of the jury, have you reached your verdict? Yes, General Balling, we have. No, 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 hold it. Look, I'm not General Balding, I'm the judge, and you are the foreman. Your line is simply, we have, right? Now then, members of the jury, have you reached your verdict? We have. And do you find the prisoner, Cedric Rackstraw, guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Excellent, very good. People stopped him in the street and said, you've given me great joy, Sam. This was a remark I often heard people saying to him. And he himself was overjoyed to be told this. Very many things that still hold good today. Why doesn't the boy tell us where we're going? Confucius say, prize fighter never show. Where he proposed a London knockout blow. You'd make up a ruddy song about it if you saw me with my head blown off. Hey, there's an idea in that too. Confucius say, each man must keep his head. <laughs> 